As a new decade began on the DePaul campus, a new symbol was put in place. The ornamental gateway which leads to East College was a gift of the class of 1890 at their 20th reunion in 1910. At Wabash, a 4-0 start by the football team, all wins by shutout, came to a sudden and tragic end when Ralph Sapp Wilson died from injuries he sustained in the Little Giants' win over St. Louis. While football continued to be played at DePauw, Wabash canceled the rest of its season. The question etched on Wilson's tombstone would have to wait another year for an answer. In October of 1911, the rivalry resumed, with DePauw supporters offered a $1 train ticket to see the Friday game in Crawfordsville. The story was what did not happen. Wabash's Skeet Lambert uncharacteristically missed all seven drop kicks he attempted, and with time expiring, his teammate Ralph Markle was hit and fumbled the ball three yards away from the goal line. DePaul coach Cotton Burnt cheered as his team recovered the loose pigskin, sealing another scoreless outcome. In September 1912, as a new school year began, George Richmond Groves was appointed DePauw's 10th president. A month later, alumni who returned to the university for Old Gold Day at McKean Field went home stunned. Wabash quarterback Skeet Lambert was a one-man wrecking crew, scoring five touchdowns, and was successful on a light number of extra points. His brother Ward, also a Wabash man, would later coach Purdue to 11 Big Ten basketball titles. Raymond Williams added three TDs of his own. One went 60 yards, another 50. DePaul never came close to the goal line. Wabash's 5-2 season was the last for coach Jesse Harper, who left to take the reins of Notre Dame's football program and brought the forward pass to the Fighting Irish just in time for Newt Rockney's senior year. On October 7, 1913, Henry Ford launched the first large-scale moving assembly line to produce his Model T. College students had something else to celebrate that fall. Thirteen days later, an excursion train took DePaul fans to Crawfordsville for an early season battle between coach Tom Bogle's 1-1-1 Tigers and the 0-1-1 Little Giants. The crowd was described as large and loud. It engaged in a howling contest before the opening kickoff. They played in raw, windy weather conditions and for the first time on a Monday. In the second quarter, DePaul had a fourth down on Wabash's 10-yard line. Halfback Gordon Thomas grabbed a delayed pass, scampered toward Paydirt, but was hit as he reached the goal line and fumbled the football. Five Scarlet players made a dive for the precious bounty, but Tiger fullback Hank Rowan gathered it in for the game's lone score. It was the first triumph for the black and gold since 1901. University of Michigan fans who held a 1914 season ticket package were among 5,100 people who saw a season opener pitting the maize and blue against the Tigers from DePauw. The result, as the New York Times noted, was a 58-0 drubbing fueled by a spate of successful trick plays by the Wolverines. All-American halfback John Malbesh, a future college football Hall of Famer, starred for the home team. Led by Captain Gordon Thomas, DePaul entered the Wabash game with a 3-4 and four record, while their foes were 5-1. and one. Another Monday afternoon game, this battle at McKean Field was scoreless until the fourth quarter, and the game-breaker was DePaul halfback Hank Rowan. His drop kick from the 25-yard line late in the game was the difference, as DePaul shut out its rivals for a second consecutive year. Six months after the fifth Indianapolis 500, which took more than five and a half hours to complete and an average speed of 89 miles per hour, fans of the Wabash DePaul football rivalry looked at the capital city as a new host for their game. The idea was moving the contest to Indy would allow more fans to attend. DePaul's student newspaper called upon lusty voiced supporters to show up in large numbers. 
as became a tradition, a large contingent marched through downtown Indianapolis west to Washington Park. A reserved seat was $2, a buck less than it cost to see the World Series that fall. In an article summarizing the 1915 game, the DePaul wrote, the less that is said, the better. It was 13-0 Wabash through three quarters, but in his one and only year as the Tigers head coach, Ralph Young watched the Bengals get mauled by the undefeated Little Giants. As the headline reads, 34-0 was the final pileup. Nineteen sixteen brought changes to the DePaul campus as groundbreaking was held for a new women's dormitory, Rector Hall, and the university dedicated its brand new Bowman Gymnasium. Wabash fans were giddy coming off a win in the big game the year before, and they were building for the future with a team that featured freshman right tackle Raymond Gaumi Neal. Four days after Woodrow Wilson was narrowly re-elected president, Fans of both teams gathered in Indianapolis for the annual grudge match. They marched downtown. This is the Wabash contingent. Here's DePause. And they produced plenty of noise for a game that newspapers predicted would be a battle to remember. Both squads came to Washington Park with four and two records. But on this day, Wabash fullback Francis Bacon provided the sizzle. He scored three touchdowns in a back and forth struggle that ended with the Little Giants winners by 13. On April 6, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson signed the bill formally declaring war against Germany and the United States entered the conflict in Europe. Six months later, women suffragists paraded down New York's Fifth Avenue carrying the signatures of a million females demanding the right to vote. Also that fall, DePauw dedicated its new women's dormitory, Rector Hall, and the faculty considered a plan to hold classes six days a week. This is an actual stub from the 1917 DePaul Wabash football game, and a $1.50 seat at Washington Park in Indianapolis provided a view of a tough battle. A first quarter 15 yard touchdown pass from DePaul's Dick Wheat to Joe Royce, and a successful extra point summed up the day's scoring, although a later Wabash drive was stopped at the one yard line. In the fall of 1918, student army training continued on college campuses like DePauw's as the Great War in Europe was winding down. But a new threat arrived, a worldwide influenza pandemic, which peaked in late October and eventually killed more than 60 million people across the globe, including more than a half million Americans, exceeding the nation's total casualties in World War I. Health-related bans on public assemblies meant many football games were canceled, and restrictions in Indianapolis forced the 1918 DePaul Wabash contest to be moved to Crawfordsville. On November 11th, in Greencastle's town square, a huge crowd celebrated Armistice Day, the symbolic end of the war. Twelve days later, trains delivered fans to Wabash for a game described by the Indianapolis Star as a walloping. In this skirmish, an early touchdown run by Buddy O'Neill got DePaul rolling. He later returned an interception 60 yards for a score. An abbreviated season ends with a 28-6 Tiger victory. It was the year DePaul welcomed its first Rector Scholars, and which spotlighted two future legends. Pete Vaughn became Wabash's head coach. His star player, senior Raymond Gaumi Neal, would later become the opposing coach in this rivalry. And students made no bones about it. Even then, a look up or down the Monon line could get them carried away. Tiger fans who made the road trip to Indianapolis for the 1919 game gathered on Monument Circle for a sizable rally before parading to Washington Park. A treasure trove of images are available from the contest, which drew a crowd of 7,000 to the stadium just west of downtown. But the scoreboard operators saw no action. The closest either team came to scoring was when DePaul's Harold Galloway returned a punt 60 yards and was pulled down at the Wabash 30. 
The story and the team's seasons don't end there. There was a post-game dance downtown, health problems incapacitated DePaul head coach Edward Buss, and four alumni from Indianapolis, including the city's mayor, Charles Jewett, took over the football team for the remainder of the season, which ended with a 2-5-1 record. Wabash's football annual summarized a 4-3-2 campaign. DePauw started a new decade by preparing for the 1920 season at a new site. Culver Military Academy became the Tigers' training camp. But during those September workouts, Hugh Gibbs suffered a spinal injury and died several days later. After an opening loss to Purdue on October 2nd, DePauw won four straight, including a game which Valparaiso decided to forfeit in the third quarter. It was scoreless with DePauw on their two-yard line when it was stopped to avoid the touchdown that was sure to follow, read a newspaper account. Pete Vaughn's Wabash team was 3-2 and two before the DePaul battle, which was again played at Indianapolis's Washington Park. It was scoreless until about a minute remained in the game. That's when Tiger quarterback Harold Galloping Galloway attempted a drop kick, which went squarely through the Wabash goalposts 52 yards away. In March of 1921, DePaul's entire student body gathered to break ground for a new athletic facility, Blackstock Field, to be named for its benefactors, 1886 graduate and trustee Ira Blackstock and his wife. Here's a closer look at the original design. By summer, a new football coach, Fred Walker, was in place. He guided the team to a 4-2 and two record before the Wabash game. Photos exist from the two skirmishes the Tigers lost to Notre Dame and Illinois, but their six triumphs included a 67-0 thumping of Kentucky's Georgetown, depicted here. Wabash was 6-1 with two foes remaining, DuPaul and Marquette, losing only to national powerhouse Army. This shows the Little Giants' 9-0 triumph over Purdue. With four future school Hall of Famers on the team, the men in red had outscored opponents 123-24. It had rained all week and the field was muddy as more than 8,000 fans gathered at Washington Park in Indianapolis. This is a shot from game day. Alonzo Goldsberry passed to George Stazan for an early touchdown and Elmer Roll scored two more TDs before the half when all the scoring was done. Wabash collected 14 first downs, DePaul had but one picked up on a little giant penalty. Within a few months, Wabash fans had something else to celebrate as the college's basketball team won a national championship. The fall of 1922 brought a new football coach to DePaul. James Ashmore came from the University of Iowa, where he was head basketball coach. This photo shows the Tigers scoring their first touchdown of the season versus Milliken. Here's a snapshot from the team's 34-7 loss to Notre Dame. Students of the era attended daily chapel in Meharry Hall and seemed to take their botany experiments to extremes. DePaul was 4-2-2 heading into the Wabash game. The Little Giants were 6-3 entering the season-ending battle with three All-State players and triumphs over Michigan State and at Purdue seen here. On November 4th, big world news. Howard Carter discovered King Tut's tomb. Exactly three weeks later, students from both schools got gussied up and made the drive to Irwin Field in Indianapolis for a game which was scoreless at halftime. Whatever Wabash coach Pete Vaughn said during the break worked. The Little Giants roared in the second half, with William Singleton scoring two touchdowns. The fearsomely named Tiny Knee took a kickoff return all the way for another score, seen here. And Wabash nailed the door shut in the fourth quarter when Elvin Elliott scooped up a block punt and scored. That headline could have read, Tuttle Domination.
In a year when Time Magazine published its first issue and the portable radio was launched, and yes, that's it there, DePauw and its faculty celebrated a record enrollment of 1,516 students. The Football Tigers opened the season by defeating Indiana University for the first time since 1896. At Wabash, Coach Pete Vaughn had lost four all-star players from his 1922 team, but this little giant squad was not rolling over. They tied Purdue, and a week before the DePaul game, waylaid IU 29-6. With the experiment of playing the rivalry contest in Indianapolis over, in November 1923, DePaul fans boarded the Monon to ride the rails from Greencastle to Crawfordsville. A sustained first quarter drive by Wabash led to a Freddie Wyatt touchdown. William Singleton added another score in the second quarter, and DePaul didn't have a single first down in the first half. With a victory, Wabash closes the season with a 4-3-2 record, while DePauw goes 4-2-1. Greencastle marked its centennial in 1924 with a big parade. A variety of floats and vintage vehicles filled the downtown area, rolling past the local opera house. DePauw's cheerleading squad spent the fall searching for new ways to form human pyramids, while the Tiger football team kept finding new ways to lose. Head coach James Ashmore abruptly left the team in mid-season and was replaced by his assistant Guy Morrison. DePaul came into the Wabash game with a 1-5 record and had been outscored 151-30. Foes included Indiana, Purdue, and Illinois. The Little Giants were 4-4 four four, but also played some heavy hitters. This shot is from the 21-7 loss to Purdue. Notre Dame and its four horsemen prevailed in South Bend 34-0. And here's proof that bulletin board material is not a recent phenomenon. In the first quarter of the rivalry game, a Wabash pass intended for Elvin Elliott was deflected and landed in Fred Wyatt's hands for a touchdown. Later, two runs for scores by Wyatt and Dana Gibson made it 21-0. DePauw had a first and goal from the Little Giant one-yard line, but the men in red held and logged another shutout. 